thank you for taking out Sundays. I mean, don't you people have children? I mean, I'm, I'm quite amazed by the number of people here. Um, I, uh, the question, there seems to be a music theme happening. My, that was me when I had hair and when I wanted to be a rock star. Um, it was around the time that uh, a speaker you, you'll hear later, uh, David released an album called Baboon Dogs. It was 1986. I had returned from Canada and that was a Seiko youth rally. Now, how does a boy from Rudapurt end up singing at uh, the Seiko rally? It started with a song and the song was Biko by Peter Gabriel. Uh, I, went to, I was an exchange student to Canada. I, like most exchange students, I finished my trick. I didn't have to do anything. I said, what courses you got? They said, pottery. I said, oh, I'll do pottery. I said, jazz band. I said, oh, as a subject, great, I'll do jazz band. And I walked into the jazz band on the first day. There was a guy called Jamie Pollock. He played bass. He said, where are you from? I said, South Africa. He said, oh, Biko. And I was, no. He said, the song Peter Gabriel about a guy called Biko. And I said, I don't know who he, he was. I then went to the school library, and I found Donald Woods' book about Biko. And it flipped my world upside down. I got three earrings, a mohawk. I came back very angry. I was going to change the world. Um, my parents said, you got so serious. Why you become so serious? And I got serious because I had lived life in South Africa and I didn't know what the real world was about. Um, I then got involved in uh, anti-apartheid politics and I ended up mediating violence in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, but I got sick of mediating the violence because violence is a symptom. It's not a cause of the problem. Um, the conflicts often around resources. So this is a map you won't find in any school books anymore. It's the map of the homelands. Somebody, Justin, talked about legacy. This is the legacy we have in South Africa. It's where the majority of people live. They live in those little colored blotches. Um, I've ended up doing a lot of work with the communities that border the Kruger National Park. Those communities were forcibly moved out and off land to make way for the park. There's been a process of land reform now, and um, I still realize, and it struck me the other day, coming into Pretoria from the north, we are a world with, uh, we're a country with two worlds. There's an urban world which is just incredible. You know, now there's fly flyovers for the Gau train and bridges, and when you come from a rural village and you enter into a place like Johannesburg, it must be intimidating. If you walk from Somalia to Johannesburg, it must be intimidating. Um, but in South Africa, we don't grow our food in urban areas. Um, we rely on our rural areas to grow, to grow food. And in rural areas, if we don't nurture those, if we don't make people live sustainable lives in rural areas, we're going to die literally in, in Johannesburg. Um, we don't have the ability to live, or we'll be importing our food from somewhere else in the world. But if, if there's no oil, you can't transport. Um, so there's a problem. If there's no electricity, you can't refrigerate. So we have a dependent relationship, and it's up to us and other people now to start developing those rural areas so it's sustainable. This is um, a friend of mine, Livingston Mashangu Malaleke. He is introducing a former TED speaker, also known as Al Gore. Now, Livingston is a leader of 15,000 people um, near a place called Punda Maria in the Kruger National Park. He's part of the Makuleke community. They now own 22,000 hectares of the Kruger National Park. That 22,000 hectares contains 75% of the biodiversity of the park. You could get rid of the other million or so hectares and their piece of land, if if it is preserved and it, since they've taken over, they've got Ramsar status, which is, means their wetlands are recognized as internationally important. They've developed two lodges. They've got 100 people working on the land, earning 2.5 million rand for a community that had, was getting no money from the land. This is what they as a community have done. Um, and this was Livingston in uh, New York. It's funny, you go there now and you speak to the leadership and they talk about my trip to New York, my trip to Washington, etc. Um, and... The thing about Livingston, he was a principal, he's now employed by South African National Parks, but they are making, they make me proud, they make South Africa proud. This is a lodge owned by a community in Madikwe. Um, they own the lodge, they built the lodge, they've got an operator in. So I've been working 
in these uh, instances where communities are claiming conservation land, but what I've realized is that is not the difficult part. The difficult part is what do you do in the villages where people live? That's what we've got to make sustainable. We've created a world where people rely on grants every month. It's a sad thing. If you go to a pension payout or grant payout, here comes the pension payout van, here comes the funeral policy sellers right behind. Um, the, and people are now dependent on that. You've got people with skills, they don't stay in those areas because there's no jobs. They come to Johannesburg and other places. Environmental resources they got are declining through over-exploitation. Um, there's a whole thing around climate change. People are experiencing droughts that they never experienced before. That's a real problem. There is a real lack of connectivity in those areas. If, if we complain in Johannesburg about my ADSL not working properly, imagine living in a, in a rural area. Um, and essentially, people are mostly disempowered. Um, but what I've seen and what they're beginning to see is that their land is their resource. So this is my idea. It's an idea which builds on a lot of other people's ideas. And it's what's called a life center. A life center, um, as I got it here, stands for livelihoods, um, information, food, and energy. And it, below is a, a bit of a draw drawing a friend of mine done, uh, has done on what we'd like to see in a life center. So in terms of what these life centers are, they're an example as well as a place where communities can learn to live and use the land sustainably. The kind of work that Manda will be talking about. Uh, people in rural areas eat mapani worms, not because they taste nice, but because it's protein. And they're hard to get and they go and harvest them. They use the, the, the trees and the leaves um, for medicine. Um, there are ways to build which are environmentally friendly. Um, this is a map which we use in rural areas. It shows what we call healthy living on the left, on the right hand side and unhealthy on the, the left. And it's a way of starting a discussion about what do you want to do with your land. The information side, we heard about connectivity earlier. Give people access to information. People know, uh, around the world know how to plant things. But you just need to find a way to get that information. Get people to start talking to each other. This is a game we play called Rivers and Trees that's based on snakes and ladders, but it's a way of people learning about things. Now, people say, how do you go down the river? Well, the way you get information card, it says your organization's no longer working. That means you, you, things don't work. You go down the river, you start again. Um, or you, you, you put in some gabions in the bottom of the tree, and you go up. Food, we need to help people. There's technology out there people can build. Each of these things costs less than 100 rand to make. This is the little nursery on the left-hand side for seedlings. That's a hydroponic in the middle, a hydroponic thing, and that's a worm farm. People can make these technologies. They, they don't need to buy things. Energy, I for a long time have been working on the, this thing in the middle here. It's an ethanol gel stove. Ethanol gel replaces paraffin. 3,000 people year, a year in South Africa die because of paraffin. There are 100,000 paraffin incidents, they call them. Either accidental poisoning or burns. 50,000 people get burnt every year because of paraffin. There is an alternative, it is renewable, and it is available, and it's called ethanol gel. Play pumps are these roundabout things that children run around, and it pumps water. Um, there are systems, plastic water geysers. We don't need to be developing the rural areas like our urban areas. We can't afford, the world can't afford that. We've got to find alternatives to do it. So that's what these life centers would do. I started with a song, I'm going to end with a couple of songs. None but ourselves can free our minds. That was Bob Marley, but it was after Stephen Biko. Um, what we need has become confused with what we want. REM. Um, one world is enough for all of us. That was the police. Um, given that we're consuming one and a half worlds every year is a problem. Um, and lastly, you too are coming next year to South Africa. Um, this is from a song called God Part Two, which was after John Lennon's God Part One. I don't believe rock and roll can really change the world. It spins in revolution, stumbles and twirls. But it can, it change my world. Now I'm trying to change other worlds, and you can as well. Thank you very much for this opportunity.